call the Wednesday, August 10th, 2011, Sheboygan Common Council Committee of the Whole to order. A couple of housekeeping things before we get started. Would somebody please turn off that air conditioner? We'll all be able to hear better. Uh, besides the uh, media that's here tonight, this meeting is being uh, televised on our local cable access station, WSCS, on a delayed basis. If you have any friends or neighbors that could not attend tonight and you would like to watch the replay of this meeting, it will be Thursday, August 11th, tomorrow, at 1 p.m. and 4 p.m., and Friday, August 12th, from 2 uh, at 2.30 p.m. and 7.30 p.m. Uh, Madam City Clerk, would you please call the roll? Belt? Here. Boren? Here. Carlson? Here. Decker? Here. Hammond? I'm sorry, Hammond? Here. Hammond? Here. Heidemann? Here. Kath? Here. Hilson? Here. Manichuk? Here. Rinfleisch? Here. Raisler? Here. Sampson? Here. Van Akron? Here. Vanderweel? Here. And Versi? Excused. Uh, let's all please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, I pledge allegiance to, to the flag of the United States, States of America, America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I will entertain a motion for approval of the minutes from the August 3rd, 2011 meeting. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve the minutes from the August 3rd meeting. Is there any discussion? Hearing no discussion, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Chair votes aye. Next thing on the agenda is the public forum. Uh, I think the way we're going to do this, if there's anybody against that wall that wants to be heard, we'll hear them first. Then we'll start with the, uh, the uh, section right behind the media here. In the front row, we'll work our way back, and then we'll start out on this side, and we'll do the same thing. So if there's anybody else, if there's anybody on this side of the wall that wants to be, uh, on the wall that wants to be heard, please raise your hands. Uh, the first person can come up. And when you come up, if you would uh, please uh, give the city clerk your name and your address, please. Excuse me. Good evening, Tom. Could you Hi. give us your, your whole name, please? Okay, uh, Thomas uh, Bowers, B O W E R S. And your address? 2120 North 36th Street. 2120. 2120. North 36th. And tonight you will have three minutes. Three minutes. Yes, sir. All right, I'll talk fast. Okay, well, thank you for allowing me to uh, speak tonight at this uh, Committee of the Whole meeting. I, I have uh, just a couple of things to uh, add to the uh, pot of fire. Number one, I would like to thank, thank uh, Fast Alderman Vicki Meyer. Vicki Myers brought up about uh, three, four years ago when this council tried to censure her when she called uh, Mr. Ryan a drunk. She had to go out and hire an attorney, so uh, I would apologize on behalf and, uh, of, of not of the council, but on citizens of Sheboygan for calling uh, Mr. Ryan what he really is. In addition, I'd like to read to you a letter that was sent to me by uh, a loyal city worker. This was while I was in office, and I didn't think it appropriate at that time that I uh, <coughs> read what's in it. Dear Alderman Bowers, it would be of interest to you to know that Bob Ryan has been talking ill of you commenting that he would rather have Alderman Meyer, as bad as she was, back, rather than an old, stupid, idiot like you. Ask Bob Ryan if he said this, watch his face. As he lies to you and claims he did not make this statement. Keep up the good work, we have faith in you, and God bless you. Now, the people did not sign their name, but since then I have talked to a couple of city workers, and one male and one female. So this was a collective letter 
and, and they told me basically what was in here. Also, another thing I would like to bring up on the Sheboygan Press internet, there's been some comment about uh, Alderman Reinfleisch, that he is behind this entire thing. Now, I've known Eric for three, four years. He's always been honorable. And I can tell you that he is not one that instigated this at all. Everyone claims he wants to be mayor. I think it's probably further from the truth. He will probably accept it when this is completed. But believe me, he is not one that went out and entertained this job. Now, for my last thing, I would like to submit to uh, Sue Richards, a, to the Sheboygan Common Council, a charge is submitted in accordance to Wisconsin Statute 1712, 1716, regarding the removal of Robert Ryan as mayor of the city of Sheboygan and Sue, it's, uh, it's been notarized. Can I give this to you now? Yes, you can, and your three minutes are up, Tom. Pardon? Three and minutes are up? Yes, they are. All right. Can I have your name, please? Sarah Oyler. Sarah, is it S-A-R-A? -A? Yes. And then O-I? O-Y. O-Y. <laughs> L-E-R. Okay, Sarah, what is your home address? 312 Ontario Avenue. 312 Ontario. All right, ma'am, you will have three minutes. Okay. Um, thank you for letting me talk at this meeting. Um, as I know the mayor, he's a good mayor of Sheboygan. Um, yes, he does drink, but my opinion is a lot of people have problems in Sheboygan, and I think he should stay as mayor because he's helping a lot of Sheboygan out, and a lot of the people in Sheboygan rely on him as someone to talk to. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Yes. Uh, anybody else against the wall that would like to speak? And we'll start in uh, well, Mr. Longmiller. Thank you. I'll change the subject for a minute. Chase, could you give us your full name? Chase Longmiller. Your address? 2611 Rolling Meadows Drive. Rolling Meadows? Rolling Meadows. Okay, and you will have three minutes, sir. Good evening, everyone. Uh, for those of you who don't know, my name is Chase Longmiller, and I'm president of the Sheboygan Firefighters Union. While three minutes isn't enough time for me to cover all the standards and facts that support why the Sheboygan Fire Department needs to maintain its current staffing levels, I'm sure that Chief Herman will as he gives his presentation later. However, I would like to say a few things which I hope I, which I hope you will help make in, right, in making the right decision tonight or next Monday. When you choose to eliminate firefighters, close stations, or shut down apparatus, you are reducing the ability of the department to respond effectively and efficiently. Remember, a fire doubles in size roughly every minute. This exponential growth is why small, seemingly manageable fires quickly and aggressively can consume a home. It is why an unattended candle can bring ruin to your home in minutes, or why, why a child playing with a lighter can cause a fire that displaces dozens of people from an apartment building. With this knowledge, why would you choose to reduce your fire protection? We hear the phrase, do more with less from corporate leaders and government officials all the time. The fact is, you cannot do more with less unless you have developed a process that reduces the number of tasks a person must perform. Firefighting is a physically demanding task that requires accomplishing specific actions in a demanding and rapidly changing environment. Ask the chief about the recent study done by the NIST on how staffing directly affects how quickly and efficiently, effectively a fire department can perform critical life-saving fire ground functions. Fewer firefighters means less gets accomplished. It's not only the citizens of Sheboygan who are affected by any downsizing of the fire department, but us as firefighters as well. We rely on each other not only to extinguish fires or rescue trapped occupants, but also to be there to rescue each other if the time comes. 
Today's fires are burning hotter and faster than ever, and a firefighter can be a victim shortly after he or she has entered the fire due to floor collapse or flashover. The firefighters needed to rescue a trapped firefighter is usually around 12. That number there almost takes up the entire amount of people we have on a scene, and there is still a fire to be extinguished. I ask you during the Chief's presentation to ask him about RIT, or Rapid Intervention Teams, and explain its function and how we accomplish it. In these tough budget times, the fact of the matter is, is that the fire department is a consumer of tax dollars. Firefighter salaries, the cost of apparatus, tools and equipment, and the continuous training. But the City of Sheboygan Fire Department per capita cost, along with the cost associated with the ambulance, according to the Wisconsin Taxpayer Alliance Municipal, Municipal Book of Facts, is $169. And the median per capita cost in the state of Wisconsin is 178. The Sheboygan Fire Department has been able to provide the number of needed firefighters at less the state median per capita. And lastly, I'd like to leave you with this. Last year, when Chief Herman announced due to staffing shortages he was going to be closing stations on a rotating basis, we firefighters in less than one week were able to go out and collect over 1,500 signatures from citizens not just in Station 5's district, but throughout the city who were opposed to closing any of the five stations. These signatures are your constituents speaking. Please listen. Good Thank timing, you. three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Longmiller. Uh, anybody at, up against the wall that wants to speak yet? Otherwise, we'll start in the front row up here. Patrick, can we have your full name, please? My name is Patrick Gillette. I live at 915 North Avenue, City of Sheboygan. You'll have three minutes, sir. Thank you. Mr. Chairman and committee members, I'm one of the complainants regarding the removal of Mayor Ryan from office. My intent is not to damage the mayor's reputation, but rather to speak to the issue of the image of the city of Sheboygan, the office of mayor, and to the perceived reflection that the image has on the citizens of this city. Actions speak louder than words. We've all heard this adage before, we can say things and we can do things, but what we do leaves a more lasting impression. It is unfortunate we have to be here under these conditions, but whatever official progress the mayor has done for the city of Sheboygan, his personal actions have brought a greater attention to this city. Whatever positive things that the mayor claims he has accomplished during his term in office, his negative actions have far been more recognizable. His negative actions have been acclaimed, proclaimed, and attached to the image of his office, the city itself, and to the individual citizens of this city. The mayor's, and therefore the city's, negative notoriety has been broadcast on radio, television, and newsprint, not only locally, but statewide, nationally, and internationally. I'm standing here before you tonight because I feel that the mayor is incapaci incapacitated by his recognizable disease of alcoholism. He can therefore request of the Common Council that he take leave from his official capacity to treat his illness by the mayor doing so. And with the acceptance of the council, the mayor can, at some time in the future, resume his official capacity or again run for office. If the mayor is removed from office by the council for cause, he's eliminated from that possibility. If the mayor hears and accepts this plea, it would save the city of Sheboygan the cost, the time, and the additional, uh, uh, the additional embarrassment of removing him from office. I thank all of the complainants for stepping up to be heard. I thank the chairman and members of this committee and council for listening, and I'm hoping that I am thanking the mayor in advance for his understanding and his acceptance of this plea. All of the citizens of the city of Sheboygan, the Common Council, and the mayor are responsible for promoting the best image possible for the city of Sheboygan. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you, Mr. Gillette. Next. Delcy, can I have your full name, please? Delcy Johnson, 1306 North 3rd Street, Sheboygan. And you will have three minutes. 
Mayor Ryan is in the gallery this evening, and I would like to address my brief comments to him. <clears throat> Mayor Ryan, I hope you will be successful in dealing with your alcoholism. My father's brother was an alcoholic, so I know the angst and embarrassment that the actions of an alcoholic can cause. But my Uncle Ben was not an elected public official, and so the angst and embarrassment was only a concern for the family. Mayor Ryan, I hope you will accept the vote of the council and do what is right for yourself, your family, and the city of Sheboygan, which you have professed to love more than anyone else. Thank you. Thank you, Dulcie. Thank you, Dulcie. Next. Whoever's next, come on up, please. Richard, can I have your full name, please? My name is Richard W. Hartman. I live here in Sheboygan at 2423 North 23rd Street. And you will have three minutes, sir. Thank you. We have been hearing words like will, plan, shall, do this or do that. They sound like promises but they are nothing but forward-looking statements which are used in an effort to get another chance. Forward-looking statements are often used by businesses to put themselves in better standing with the people they must deal with. And they are nothing but declarations referring to the future and often never become fact. This has proven to be the case with the issue at hand. Compassion is one thing, but to be smitten a third time, we will always be known as fools. It may sound petty to some, but it is another matter to consider. Bob Ryan has been using the city garage to store his vehicle. This vehicle is not his day-to-day -day transportation to and from City Hall. It is illegal to use city property for personal gain. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Mr. Hartman. Anybody in that section that wants to be heard? Yes, sir, step forward, please. Yes, sir, can I have your name, please? My name is Jeff Wessel. My address is 2517 North 10th Street, Sheboygan. And Wessel is, how do you spell it, W-E-S-S-E-L? Correct. Okay. And you will have three minutes. When I found out that there were three proposals presented to the fire chief on reorganizing the fire department, I sent an email to my alderman and asked him how much my property tax bill of $3,100 would go down for each proposal. I received no reply. About a week later, I resent the email and still received no reply. I sent the third email to him and stated that this was my third attempt to find out how much my taxes would go down and I still haven't received a reply. I then contacted him on a third time and he was not able to answer me that time either. After another attempt, I got a reply from him and was as follows. Well, Jeff, I have been gone for over a week and do not check my email wh when I am gone. I can inform you that since you are a Sheboygan firefighter yourself, you have a misconception on taxes. First of all, your $3,100 property taxes are subsidized by the taxpayers and you also have a misconception on how much tax money goes towards the fire department. For your records, per the city assessor's department and the former city assessor, 
it is $501.78 per parcel that goes towards the fire department, not the $28 or whatever it was you guys were saying. I hope you understand that I am doing what is best interest of the majority of the constituents and the taxpayers. If you would like a breakdown of what we will be saved, you can either ask your chief or wait for him to present it to the council and then ask our finance director what each will do for your taxes. I hope you have a wonderful day. Peel, please feel free to pass my email along to whomever you like. I then emailed him back and asked, how does he know that I have a misconception on taxes? And how does he figure that my taxes are subsidized? I thought that since he introduced the proposal that he may have actually done some research on it. I, and I hope that he would also do the, what the majority of his constituents want and not the vocal minority. But I, would not, but I would not have any way of know this. No reply. I then sent another email asking him, what does he consider a parcel? Is he inferring that JL French, Walmart, Acuity, and myself all pay the same amount for fire service? Wouldn't it be more accurate to go on an assessed value or a per capita basis? If you were to do that, then your numbers wouldn't be as sensational to the person that has a property that is valued at $30,000 and you say our numbers aren't correct. Are you going to ask the police to reduce their department since they get $657 per parcel? When the chief presents his breakdown of the proposals, are you going to vote on it at that time? Or will the council allow time for public input? Is your per parcel number before or after shared revenue? How much money has the ambulance taken in year to date? Will you support the results of the Whitewater, Whitewater survey? This may surprise you, but I still haven't received a reply. Alderman Versi, when will you answer my questions? Excuse me. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, sir. Next. Yes, sir, can I have your Good name? Good evening. Uh, David L. Gartman, G-A-R-T-M-A-N. 5509 Menning Road, MOE, NN, ING. 5505? Correct. Okay. 5909. 09, I'm sorry. Um, at, that's um, Sheboygan. Okay, and you will have three minutes. Um, thank you very much. Um, you'll all f found a copy of it with uh, Town of Wilson letterhead. I'm David Gartman. I'm chairman of the Town of Wilson, which is your neighboring municipality to the south. We have the checkerboard uh, uh, south side boundaries. Uh, so our, um, our, our, thing, our things that are done in our area do affect each other. So I, our Town of Wilson board um, last uh, few weeks ago, I'd like to read uh, the statement that uh, they sent me here to uh, uh, address the council and the mayor. Uh, Dear city, uh, older persons and Mayor Ryan, it has been brought to our attention the city of Sheboygan is in the process of reorganizing its fire protection services. The Town of Wilson encourages you to be cautious in changing your structure for fire coverage. Our town board supports Mabus and neighboring communities working together with significant fires. But we are hoping that you do not uh, restructure your fire protection services in a manner which would involve a significant increased dependency on neighboring communities. The Town of Wilson Board thanks you for your opportunity to share our concerns. Sincerely, David L. Gartman, Chairperson Town of Wilson. I'd just like to give you a little background on how we're structured. Um, I would like to invite communication at any time. Uh, we will come in or if, if you want to come out and speak with us. We are not a municipal fire department. Our, we contract services. Our, we have a volunteer 501C, the Black River Fire Department, and we also contract with the Oosburg Fire Department uh, for a section of our coverage in the southern edge of the town. Uh, what this means is that it wouldn't be the elected officials who would have to make decisions. We own the equipment, the town residents and the uh, taxpayers own the equipment, but the, the firemen themselves are a 501C. So I would encourage any input. There's two members here this evening uh, that are here also, Corey Wentland and Brian Schmidt, if you want to hear from them or ask them questions or any time in the future because they'd be the ones who'd have to come in with the mutual aid. We want to thank you for all the cooperation in the past. This is, uh, Mavis is the mutual aid alarm box system which can affect many communities how uh, they shift over. It's a new uh, scheme and it's very well done. So, uh, you know, 
you, you make decisions in your own boundaries. I always say that in our town too. Uh, your municipality has to make your decisions. But some decisions you make have consequences to the community. Community doesn't have boundaries. So I appreciate any working together, or any lines of communication in the future on the challenge before you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Garvin. Next. <coughs> Anybody in the first couple of rows up here? Uh, I believe you're next, sir. Mel, can we have your full name, please? It is Milton R. Storm, and, and I reside at 1736 Marvin Court, and it's in the city of Sheboygan. And you will have three minutes, sir. Thank you for this opportunity. I will try to be brief. I have submitted a communication and a complaint to the city clerk not to remove Mayor Ryan. There are too many people that are using their own selfish emotions to make negative comments, and I don't think are valuable. I learned from my mail carrier that Jackie Duplain may live in my area. I wrote a letter in response to her editorial letter in the press, and I'm asking the president if I may read that letter. If I can find it. As long as it's within the uh, three minutes, Mr. Storm. Yeah. Well, I'll read it at the common council meeting. Must have adopted it someplace. Well, I do attend many of the council meetings and committee meetings. I've always found Mayor Ryan to be of a clear mind and a sound wisdom at council meetings and also at committee meetings. Mayor Ryan hosted a public forum in the police department conference where we talked about how to improve the revenue. I had the privilege of being seated next with County Administrator Wayne uh, Adam Payne at that meeting. Again, the Mayor Ryan hosted a forum at the University of Wisconsin Sheboygan, and I again had the privilege of being seated next to Adam Payne. I support Mayor Ryan with the plans of the Shuker property. My father in law and my mother in law were good friends with them. My father in law did not drive, and Walter Shuker uh, did the driving when they did socializing. I thank uh, Mayor Ryan for his plans that, uh, or I don't know, for the plans that he adds for the Shuckett property. There has been other leading citizens here who have been DWI, and one of them is the superintendent of schools, Joe Sian. I feel sorry for the loss of his son. But I would encourage him that after the darkness is over and, or the sadness is over and the darkness of the night is past, the next morning the sun will always rise and a new day begins. Lord willing, I hope to see you all at the council meeting Monday. Thank you, Mel. Thank you, Mr. Storm. Anybody else want <coughs> to be heard? Yes, ma'am. Joanne, can we have your full name, please? Joanne M. Scribner. And your address? 3 Seneca Trail. And you will have three minutes. Yes. Probably public officials have to be very careful of their conduct in public. So I would advise Mayor Ryan, as the mayor of Sheboygan, and as my friend, to stay out of bars and taverns. I have a husband who is the love of my life, who also likes to drink, sometimes a lot, but he drinks at home, which is a good thing. Mayor Ryan has said at the August 1st Common Council meeting that if he is caught drinking in public, he would resign. I believe we should give Mayor Ryan another chance. Would you not want another chance? to improve your public or private life? I know I would. Three strikes and you're out. 
It's a good thing God does not look at us, at us that way. He gives us chance after chance after chance after chance, many, many chances to repent from our sin and accept him as our God and Savior and Lord. Anyone who speaks anonymously against anyone, anonymous sources, have no credibility with me. If you are going to voice a complaint against me or Ryan or any other public elected official, state your name, whether it's in print or on the air. Don't be a wimp. If someone is addicted to a pornography and sends porn over the internet at work, on the job. That person is usually fired. If they view pornography at home, in the privacy of their home, they don't lose their job because they did it in private, not in public. Now, Mayor Ryan, when he goes drinking, he's off the clock. It's not on the time clock. It's his private life. Thanks to the dastardly use of camera phones being used without people's permission or without their knowledge many times, we in the public sector, sector and the private sector have no more privacy. This is not right. Alcoholism is not a disease like cancer or pneumonia or the flu. It is an addiction. I believe, though, that Mayor Ryan is up to the challenge of getting rid of his addiction to alcohol. Mayor Ryan has done far too many, many good things and made far too many good business decisions for this city of Sheboygan that he should not remain the mayor of Sheboygan. So, Sheboygan Common Council and citizens of Sheboygan, please give Mayor Ryan another chance to be the great mayor that he is. Sheboygan's on a good track. Um, I've Thank seen. You, done? Three minutes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Scribner. Is there anybody else that would like to be heard? Is there anybody else that would like to be heard? Is there anybody else that would like to be heard? Okay. I want to thank everybody for uh, uh, contributing to the public forum tonight. Next on the agenda, we have the chairman's comments. Uh, I don't have any at this time, but I may reserve reserve uh, that for later in the meeting. Uh, the next thing we have on our agenda is items for discussion and possible recommendation to the Common Council. Resolution number 42-11-12, Council document number 716. A resolution requesting the fire chief to draft a long range plan for the City of Sheboygan Fire Department by the second council meeting of August 2011. Chief Herman and staff, you're on. Excuse me, Alderman Van Ackren. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, on this resolution, I would make a motion to hold this until we uh, get the UW Whitewater study back. We, that is currently pending. I would make a motion to hold this at this time. Uh, it looks like it dies for a lack of a second. Thank you for the motion. Uh, Chief Herman, proceed. Thank you, Chairman Boren, Clerk Richards, members of the council, Mayor Ryan, members of the public, for this opportunity to discuss the long range plan for protecting our fine city. In any community, the fire department is in place to provide public protection and safety. This is, encompasses far more than just fire protection. Natural gas emergencies, hazardous chemical spills, industrial accidents, car accidents, water rescues, emergency medical services, and extrications. And just about anything else that you can think of, the fire department is the first and last line of defense in a community. When people do not know who to, else to call, it usually ends up being the fire department. Coincidentally, this afternoon while I was typing this exact sentence, we got a call to get an animal out of a tree. While I've never been a big fan of PowerPoint presentations where I stand up here and point at a screen and read to you of uh, all the material that you already have in front of you, um, therefore what I would like to do tonight 
is to explain to you how do I came to the conclusions in the different scenarios and answer the many questions that you may have. The success, success of any fire department essentially relies on three factors. Early notification of the emergency, and some of this is out of our control. The rest is accomplished through having solid smoke detector and fire protection, protection codes in place and having a quality dispatch center. Combined dispatch will improve an already great 911 system in place in this city. Quick response times. Nearly all of our outcomes are dependent on response times. Much of what you will hear tonight is based on response times. It is difficult to find any article or study done on a fire department that is not centered on response times. Response times are generally controlled by station location and having firefighters available to respond at any time. And finally, equipment and firefighters, getting enough resources on scene in a timely manner. The National Fire Protection Association places this at 15 firefighters on scene within eight minutes is the key to safely controlling an emergency. Everything you have in front of you is based on these three factors. I would like to start by giving you a short overview of how the fire department operates today. As I've outlined in your packets, the department has been undergoing a downsizing for about the past 35 years. Because of technology, downsize, downsizing has been accomplished without any loss in service. When I started, it took six people to, to uh, put up an aerial ladder. With today's new aerial uh, ladders, it only takes two or three. Firefighting foam has been introduced to supplement water. We used to have two and a half inch hose lines that took five people to maneuver. We now can deliver the same amount of water through an inch and three quarter hose line that only takes three people. Thermal imaging cameras, lighter jaws of life equipment, the list goes on and on, have all enabled us to do more with less people. However, the environment we work in has also changed. Lightweight construction, increased fire loads, and the corresponding higher temperatures that we face has shortened the time that we can safely fight a fire from the inside of a structure, making quick response all that more important in today's firefighting world. I'd like to explain briefly how the fire department operates on a day-to-day -day basis. All of our fire inspections, public education programs, and training are conducted on duty while in service to serve the public. We attempt to stagger these duties, keeping as many crews available as possible at all times. With over 2,000 fire inspections to conduct a year, we divide these among our eight fire and EMS crews at about 250 inspections per crew. Some of these inspections can take an entire day to complete. When we have a crew out in the center of a factory, we have enough depth to cover for that crew when a call comes in that they need to respond to. Typically when we're doing a fire inspection, we're, we're taken through the building with either an owner, a manager, or a maintenance, maintenance personnel. When we need to interrupt that inspection to respond to a call, it not only interrupts their day, it interrupts our day. So when we have less crews to do fire inspections, we'll be interrupting uh, the business community as well when we need to leave that inspection to go to a call and come back at another time. It also, with less crews available and more fire inspections per crew to do, it leaves us less time for critical fire training. We put on, put on over 200 public education programs a year. Most of these are in our elementary schools in the city. When we are doing these programs, we take the fire unit out of service to conduct this program. The schools have set aside this time for us and it is not fair for us to leave during that presentation. Having enough crews available to cover for those calls when that crew is out of service doing that program is critical to what we do. The thousands of hours of training that, we, that are accomplished each year are done by training half of our crews at a time while spreading the other half throughout the city and the stations to cover calls. If we reduce the number of crews, the number of stations that we have, the only way that we'd be able to effectively train would be to draw all the people to one area of the city for our training, thus leaving the rest of the city uncovered. The other option is to use overtime and that is just not feasible. I also believe there's a great need in our community for new safety programs to be delivered to the elderly and people in assisted living and apartments. We also need to develop 
an inspection program for rental units and single family homes in problem neighborhoods because this is where the majority of our fires occur. I could show you charts and bore you with endless statistics on response times. However, I think a couple of pictures and reports of actual fires are worth a thousand words and will graphically show how important response times are to the outcomes of the fire department. The first picture we have is that of a stove fire that we were able to get there with a fast response time and control to just the stove. There was very little damage to the rest of the kitchen. Uh, here you see the rest of the kitchen uh, involved in that stove fire, very little damage. Quick response, we were able to extinguish that fire on the stove. Here you see the damage just above the stove. The next set of pictures are where the fire maybe had a little bit bigger head start on us and it did spread to some of the surrounding cabinets and appliances on the counter. Here we, we were able to control this fire and maintain it to the room of origin, the kitchen. Some of the pictures will show the rest of the house that had light smoke damage, but it was basically just the kitchen that had the fire damage. So if we had a longer response time and weren't able to control the fire and keep it in the kitchen, you'd have much more damage throughout the rest of the house. This picture is of 518 North 14th Street. We had a three minute response time to this call. As you can see the fire, it was at um, 12 o'clock in the morning, so it did have a little bit of a head start on us before we got the call. This is again a picture of the same building. This is 2314 Indiana Avenue. Coincidentally, it occurred uh, within a day or two of the fire on North 14th Street. On this fire, we had a four minute response time to this call. On this fire, an infant did perish because they had to jump out of the second story window prior to our arrival. On the first slide that I showed you on North 14th Street with our three minute response, we were able to rescue a young lady out of that window that the, the ladder is pointing into. On this call, I can definitely say a one minute longer response time, that individual, while I don't know if she would have perished, would have had to jump and sustained injuries. We are unable to see whether a one minute quicker response time on Indiana Avenue would have made a difference, but as you can see in our business, every second does count. Uh, the next picture, the double picture. These two pictures are pictures of two fires that occurred last summer. The one on the left was in a fire on Indiana or Union Avenue in a church. Uh, it was started in a dumpster outside. It was fueled by the natural gas meter, which had ruptured. We had a, just over a three minute response time and were able to stop this fire before it got up into the attic. Time of the call was about two, two in the afternoon. The fire on your right was identical circumstances. It was the next afternoon. It occurred at four o'clock in the afternoon uh, in a township next to, the, next to us. Um, quality fire department, all conditions the same, started on a rear deck and was fueled by a propane fryer. The only difference between these two scenarios is a three and a half minute response time on the left and about a 20 minute response time on the right. Water supply and everything else was the same. Uh, the next thing we have for you is a video. Uh, it's called Firepower. Um, it's been around for quite a long time, but it does a very good job, better than I can do, of showing um, the speed uh, that a fire does spread.
maybe you could get the lights, Chief. I think it would be better. Thank you. You are about to see a fire, one that has been planned, a demonstration fire. An ashtray with a still smoldering cigarette is dumped into the wastebasket. Two minutes, eight seconds. The contents of the wastebasket are smoldering. Seven minutes, three seconds. The wastebasket is in flames. Nine minutes, 14 seconds. The room is an inferno. You are about to experience the power of fire. A carelessly discarded cigarette is the cause of this fire, but home fires can start many ways. Space heaters, wood stoves, faulty electrical equipment, and cooking, among others. 30 seconds from first flame, the sofa ignites. From this point, fire grows rapidly. If you discover a fire, leave immediately and call the fire department from a neighbor's house. Two minutes, 30 seconds. The temperature above the couch is now 400 degrees Fahrenheit. That's over 200 degrees Celsius. Three minutes, 41 seconds. The energy in the room suddenly ignites everything. Flash over. Fire grows so fast that the fire department may not be able to rescue anyone trapped inside. wearing protective clothing enter to search the house and to combat the fire. Would you recognize this? It's the living room. There's not even a faint reminder of a comfortable room we saw earlier. Nothing identifiable but the coils from this chair. It took just four minutes from the first flame in the wastebasket for the temperature in this room to reach over 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit. The fire ultimately became so hot the window glass softened and flowed like happy. This is part of a residential sprinkler system, a device designed to spray water during the early stages of fire development. Watch what happens now. A fire identical to the one you just saw has been started in this room. Sprinkler systems have long been used very successfully in commercial buildings control fires, minimize damage, and save lives. They have now been adapted for home use. As before, the fire grows rapidly. Smoke fills the room from the ceiling now. And so for less than the cost of the furniture in this room, lives and property have been saved. So as you can see, uh, with how quickly fires uh, grow in size, the, uh, how rapid we can respond to that emergency makes a big difference in saving lives and saving property. Uh, the next thing we have, you have the, video, the uh, audio? Yeah. Uh, next thing I'd like to play for you is an actual 911 tape that, or call that was placed in the, in the city of Sheboygan for, I believe it was a kitchen fire. We've been using this tape for probably 20 years or so now. Um, <coughs> when we teach our, the kids in schools. Okay, you and your mother get dead, get everybody out. Okay, 
Now, as I said, this is an actual 9 call. One call from City of Sheboygan happened about 20 years ago. And as you can tell, it's quite chaotic when this is occurring. Um, and the dispatcher did inform them that help was on their way, and, and we did respond within three to three and a half minutes. Um, I sure wouldn't want to be a dispatcher that would have to tell this person that we're initiating a call in to get the proper resources there to respond for help. Uh, as you can see, again, response times are critical to what we do. Um, I'd like to show you a couple charts now of the differences in the scenarios that I've presented to you. The first column on the left, uh, and everything that I presented to you is based on our actual 2010 uh, fire call numbers. We had 160 fires in the city last year. 118 of those fires, the fire department was directly responsible for extinguishing. 42 of them either self-extinguished or the bystanders put them out before we arrived. Of those 160 fires, three of them, we did not contain them to the room of origin or the piece of equipment that had started on fire. Uh, one of those fires uh, that can be, uh, part of that can be contributed to, it was a time when Station 5 was closed and they would have been the second unit to arrive on scene, so it did help with the spread of that fire. Um, one other one was a basement fire that actually um, first showed smoke on the second floor and we had a difficult time finding the seat of that fire. Uh, the third one was one that had a large head start on us and actually spread to the neighboring houses. So then as we move into the uh, four station scenario, um, and we've, we ran all the response times off of our actual calls of last year. Uh, we did um, radiuses around the fire stations estimating increased response times. And we also used a mathematical uh, formula provided by a Mr. Schramm that had done a uh, paper on the fire department last year for Lakeland College. Uh, they all came out within seven seconds of each other. So what we see is um, of those 118 fires, we now can expect that because of the increased response times, six of those fires instead of three will likely uh, spread beyond the room and contents um, that was started when we were called. And now this is not saying that the house is going to burn down, but it's saying that maybe that kitchen, that stove fire becomes a kitchen fire, possibly that kitchen fire becomes a first floor fire, um, possibly the garage fire extends to an, uh, the house or neighboring uh, property. As you move to the three station scenario, um, again, we have less fire resources available, our response times increase, so those 160 fires now become uh, what's the number, 26 on the bottom? 26 that uh, we can expect that we are not going to be able to, to contain to the uh, room of origin or the appliance that started on fire. And as we move on down to the paid on call, once again, where we have less and less um, fire apparatus in the city to respond to, uh, those numbers uh, continue to grow. This graph is a uh, snapshot of what we expect our response times to do. Again, the uh, green column is actual calls from last year. Of our 3,751 calls, 263 of those calls uh, we did not respond to in less than five minutes. 75 of those calls, it took us longer than eight minutes to respond to. Um, the reason for those usually are, uh, when you look at our calls, uh, we had 908 times last year when we got multiple calls at one time. Typically 40% of those calls occur in the, in the same station area. So when one call comes in, that station is busy. The second call comes in, it needs to be covered by another station, uh, hence longer response times. So as we move through the chart, as we have less and less fire uh, apparatus available and less stations open, um, our response times get longer and our outcomes, um, as it showed in the last table, uh, also get worse. So with that, um, I guess I'd like to open it up to your questions. Any of the aldermen have any questions? Alderman Van Akron. Thank you, Chairman. Certainly a lot of information um, was covered by the Chief. I guess I would just like um, 
few clarifications. You, you've touched on the response times. I believe there's a chart in here that goes over the response times, um, showing that if we went to a four station model, we would increase by approximately 50 seconds. Going to a three station model, you're looking at an increase of approximately two minutes. And then the paid on call model, which is asked for in this re resolution, um, you know, there's a question mark as to how long that would take. Can you just touch on those response times and the effects of what those response times are gonna do? I mean, you touched on some of the property damage effects, but also the survivability of people coming out of those fires, the injuries that could be called. Also, can you touch on the, uh, the EMS service and how that would be affected by any reorganization that this resolution calls for? Um, the question mark on the response times on the paid on call system, as we were analyzing our response times and plugging them into each of these scenarios, when we got to the paid on call scenario because of having only um, basically two and a half stations open um, and enough, enough people to staff two uh, fire apparatus, it became very difficult to um, determine what our response times were gonna be in the calls that were over eight minutes. Um, I think a, a, a good number of those calls we figured were going to be 15 to 20 minute response times, which was really going to throw our average uh, response time off. And where we run into problems when we uh, close stations is the depth of our service. Um, as a, and the numbers that we went through where we have so many multiple calls, um, 908 in a year, as I said before, uh, 698 are two calls at once, 183 times we had three calls going on at once, uh, 21 times five calls at once, uh, and five times six calls at once, I believe. So as we lose um, fire apparatus and stations, we can no longer handle those extra calls, and that's where we would have to go to another system of relying on mutual aid, um, and that's where we run into some of those longer response times or calling um, people in. In addition, we also analyzed all of our calls where we had three fire apparatus on one call, four fire apparatus on one call, and five fire apparatus on one call. At those times, also all of our resources are tied up. Uh, so in the past, um, we'd scramble to free up one rig from the scene, or we would use callback personnel on overtime to staff a spare apparatus. Uh, so at five stations, we were able to handle all of our calls, uh, and we used mutual aid four times last year. As we would go down to a four station module, um, that number is going to increase significantly for the number of times that we would need help from our neighboring communities. And as we go into the three station scenarios, that number increases dramatically. Um, to answer your question on how those response times, um, increased response times are gonna affect our outcomes. Um, as you saw in the video on how fires grow, there's also a graph that's put out by um, the National Fire Protection Association that shows a definite curve of at the eight minute mark um, of how a fire just gets out of the control um, of, of what our resources are. So it's, it, we're at the eight minute mark is very key for us to get on scene. Um, that's why our outcomes in uh, last year and other years have been so successful as we get on scene and put a fire out while it's still small. Um, the times that we've had to call for mutual aid, that fire has gotten beyond our capabilities. We end up calling the town of Wilson. We end up calling the town of Sheboygan for help. Uh, we just can't staff for those larger fires. So as, those in as our response times increase, the size of the fires are going to increase. The number of times that we're able to contain that to room and origin are going to decrease, and we'll have larger fires, and we need more resources then to put those fires out. Um, to answer your question on the um, emergency medical part of it, um, we have a great um, track re record this past year on cardiac arrest um, saves. We're up about at about 28%, I believe. National average is about 6 or 7%. That's not because that we have the best paramedics in the world. It's because of the system that you, the council, and we have built here. It's the quick response times. Um, it's the first responders that get there on scene um, ahead of the ambulance and can start treating these patients. So, as our response times increase, um, I can expect that cardiac arrest uh, success rate to actually start to go down. Um, the, the response time of our ambulances in these scenarios will all stay the same. It's the response time of the first responders, which really are also a key part of this plan that's going to decrease and, and affect our outcomes. Thank you, Alderman Van Akron. Any other 
Alderman Hammond. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Chief, for putting this together. Certainly appreciate it. A couple quick questions um, as I was going through here. Noticed you were talking about if we went down to four stations, water rescues. Obviously, we live on a nice big air conditioner over there. Um, how many water rescues have we been part of just, in, let's use 2010? Um, last year, we actually had a, a rather busy year. Okay. Um, if I was going to give you a number, I'd say it was a handful. Okay. Um, this year, we were out a couple times. Actually, last week, we had one. Okay. Um, the next question I had was, how often do we, do we respond to Town of Wilson or Town of Sheboygan um, on calls out there versus um, them coming? Yeah. Probably less than what we request them. Okay. Um, and, and part of that is due to the fact that um, when Mavis was developed roughly three, four years ago, it was in the beginning stages, um, the powers that be um, in the city here, uh, the mayor at that time, uh, had the fire chief inform our neighboring communities that if you want our services, you need to annex. So if you're familiar with the way Mavis works, there's all cards that we sign as to what, um, what we're going to provide neighboring communities. At this time, we are not on the neighboring communities first out call when there's smoke or flames, um, which is something that, in my opinion, needs to change. We need to offer that same service to them. Okay. And then finally, in your proposal, you talk about going to a regional fire, a regional plan for fire protection. You know, could you just maybe elaborate on and what you would envision that looking like? Um, because you, again, you mentioned that that's the long range um, goal that you, you would see. Thank you. Um, in the past years, couple of years since I've been chief, I've been sent to numerous communities. Um, numerous other communities have been brought up as comparables, most of those um, paid on call communities. And what all those cities had in common is that they were all surrounded by uh, cities that had full-time paid fire departments within a number of miles of their border. Um, you, you can see the reports that I have uh, given the mayor of, of my trips around the state. That's one thing that we do not um, have in Sheboygan's location. We are surrounded by volunteer departments. Uh, as the price for fire apparatus continues to rise, um, the last engine that we purchased was $455,000. I would anticipate the next aerial ladder to be an $800,000 to a million dollar range. Uh, it just does not make sense for all of us, especially as close as we are here in Sheboygan County, to continue each purchasing our own pieces of fire apparatus. For the number of fires we have, we need to share apparatus, we need to spread that cost out. And I believe that to, to stabilize the, the cost for fire protection, to help out the surrounding communities and their struggles with maintain, maintaining members, we need to develop some type of a regional um, fire service. How far out that goes, whether it's the town of Wilson and town of Sheboygan only, whether it goes to Kohler um, Falls and even Kohler, or uh, Plymouth is something that we definitely need to explore. I think we need to get together as fire chiefs, uh, community leaders, and say how can we do this better? How can we, because we had 160 fires out of our 3,700 calls, um, that's 17% I believe of our actual, uh, of the fire calls, our fires, um, and every other community has that too. We need to share resources, um, and we, when we actually do have that live fire, we need to all respond to that. Thank you, Alderman uh, Hammond. Uh, Alderman Reisler. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I just <coughs> wanted to point out this document, uh, the Sheboygan Fire Department Organization from 2005 to 11, and, and then the comparisons that it has with other uh, cities throughout um, our immediate area. I, I guess, correct me if I'm wrong, Chief, but in looking at that, we actually are in, in pretty much in line with, with other places. Granted, we're one or two off here and there. Is that correct? I believe our staffing is adequate. Um, I believe our um, um, we are a little bit light on the command staff compared to other cities. And just so that the people at home and the people in the, in the, in the crowd understand, your suggestion coming out of this long-term plan would be to uh, maintain the current staffing levels uh, roughly and also the five stations, correct? If you're looking strictly at how do we provide the best protection to the city of Sheboygan, that's my recommendation. As, I've, uh, as I have in your information there, um, the five stations in the city of Sheboygan were laid out systematically as, a, as the city grew. Um, if you look at a map and you draw circles around those stations, they're all even. If you close one of those stations, you're creating a hole somewhere in the city unless you rebuild stations to make up that hole. 
And the last thing before I, I stop my questioning is, uh, I guess last year you were given a budget to work with correct? And you made your budget last year? I made the budget last year and am under this year. Um, so, I, and I guess that is the same as what other department heads are asked to do, correct? Yes. Uh, we give you the amount of money, you work within it, and you make the decision what the best plan is? That's correct. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make the assumption that you think and I think that I don't know too much about fires <laughs> and I don't know much about plowing snow. So I guess I'm leaving that in your hands to make the decision of, of what to do with the money we give you. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman Raisler. Alderman Sampson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Chief, for putting all this together. It's, it's a fair amount of paperwork we all got. Um, just a couple questions. You get mentioned a couple times um, that you showed up on some fires and they, were, they already had a fairly good head start on you. So does it matter, I guess, when you get called at the point of a fire? I mean, there's a lot of unknowns. For you guys, you can respond in five minutes, but if you weren't called, you know, the fire had already been going for 10, 15 minutes or something like that. There's just a lot of unknowns. So it's, as I said in the first, one of the first factors, that is the great unknown on um, the notification. And typically, you'll see the larger fires at night when there aren't as many people out on the streets and they're not noticed as readily. The other part of that is that you really need to have quality smoke detector fire protection ordinances in place which uh, provide that early notification as much as if you look at the cities that have um, smaller departments uh, some of the cities that are newer cities they haven't enacted uh, ordinances that have um, hardwired smoke detection systems so you, you don't have tampering with the nine volt batteries they have uh, sprinkler codes in place for all commercial buildings um, some of them even have uh, monitored and sprinkler system codes in place for residences. So all those things help in the early notification. But yeah, that's the great wild card in, um, in some of the ones that we're not able to contain uh, is how early are we notified. Okay, uh, just and if I may just keep continuing. Um, with that in mind then, would it, would it make sense to possibly, if there was a point where if, if budget constraints called for losing one of the fire stations to have some sort of a hybrid system maybe if they were on call where I grew up in Indiana we had a lot of volunteer firefighters and we saw them everywhere they were driving their personal vehicles everywhere uh, so they're all over the city at that point so they could show up or respond to a fire for the example you had that stove fire where if they were able to put it out fairly quickly it stayed right there on the stove could that be something that could be entertained if there was some sort of a hybrid system where you had folks that may be located all over the place driving around their normal daily lives, they had something that may have, they were close, they could respond to it right away. Could that be something that would benefit? Uh, obviously anything that you can put together that allows for quicker response is going to help. Um, however, even in those type of systems that you're speaking of, those firefighters first need re to respond to the fire station to get the necessary equipment um, needed to put that fire out. Um, there are uh, national standards that we live by as far as how many people need to be there before you can even <coughs> enter that building um, and we have to live by those so as far as having it'd be great to have people if they were in every neighborhood with a fire truck I guess and three other buddies with them that would work but you know they still need to respond to the station to get the equipment okay and then one more question we had a, we had a gentleman come up earlier part of the public comment discussed cost per parcel do we have do we have a minute or, or, or so could you explain how that's figured out cost per parcel so that we all know how that's figured out? I'm, I'm guessing that um, um, Alderman Versi took the uh, entire cost of the fire department and divided it by the 17,021 parcels that are within the city and came up with that number. Is that how it's done? Um, I think that's one way of doing it. I know there's a number of ways to do it. I don't think that that would be an accurate way, I guess if you were going to do that for all city departments, uh, the cost per parcel for police department would be $658. Um, just for the parks alone would be 133. Uh, Department of Public Works 570. Um, the library 186. And I calculate the fire department at 479. So um, that's one way of doing it, one way of doing a comparison, but that's not the way that the uh, uh, the cost for any city services allocated. And, and the reason I only brought that up was because it was made, it was an issue. So I just wanted to get some clarity. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman Sampson. Are there any other questions? I just Alderman Hammond. Thank you. 
not to belabor this point, but um, obviously we want to move forward and have the most efficient fire protection out there. Have, have our friends, um, I know that the uh, town chairman from the town of Wilson spoke earlier. Um, has there been any willingness on their part or town of Sheboygan or Kohler, Sheboygan Falls to at least come together to discuss a regional, um, a regional fire plan? Um, I just wanted to Part of the resolution that is in front of you and what I was directed to do was to, I forget the exact words, I believe, um, approach the um, neighboring fire services to develop a more proactive um, method of mutual aid. I did that. Um, I went out and spoke to the town of Sheboygan Fire Department, spoke with the town of Wilson. Um, both of them expressed um, that what we're looking at doing here is, would be very taxing on their resources, something that would probably be above uh, and beyond what they would be capable of handling. Um, both of them expressed um, concern that the times that they have, the least amount of people available are in the afternoon hours. Um, the times that we have the most multiple numbers of calls are between 8 a.m. and 7 p.m. So uh, I think that just asking them to respond to calls that we are not ha able to handle is would not be realistic. Well, I'm, not, I'm not talking about the Mavis type calls. I'm talking in your, again, your proposal, you indicated a, a regional fire plan for fire protection, more of a kind of a regional fire department. Have they at least bought but, into having the conversation about that? I haven't begun that conversation yet, but just to make it clear, Mavis and that type of a system is a completely different system. Mavis was set up for very large incidents that can bring enough people to that incident to handle it while also backfilling all the communities that are supplying that, the resources to handle that major incident. Mavis is not set up for handling routine calls in a community that you are not able to do. And uh, within the Mavis agreement is um, the, the uh, department providing the aid is not able to charge the, uh, the city requesting it, it's within their agreement so that you can't have monetary amounts passing back and forth for that coverage. But uh, to answer your question, no, I have not started the formal discussions of uh, forming more regional fire protection. Thanks. Thanks, Alderman Hammond. Alderman Raisler. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd, I'd ask if you had any questions, otherwise I'd like to entertain a motion. Yeah, I do have a few. When you're done. <laughs> I was hoping somebody else yep. would ask me, but when you're done. I got a few. Uh, Again, Chief, thanks for uh, preparing this. It was uh, very interesting and very informative, but I do have a couple questions. Uh, you made a comment that I was looking for here, and I can't find it, about combined dispatch possibly being an asset to the department. And it just so happens that the City County Shared Services Committee has asked the, uh, our police chief and the sheriff to work on a plan uh, to, to further those discussions. My question is, uh, have you been in the loop on those discussions and could you possibly enlighten us on how combined dispatch would be an asset to the department? Um, I have not been in the loop on those discussions. Um, the second part of that question is there's a lot of, there's a couple parts that go into your response times. The first part is how long does it take to handle that call when it comes into a dispatch center? Second part is your turnout time the time it takes when that call is sent to the station or the fire rig till when you're actually on the road and en route. And the last part is when do you get there? Um, in my opinion, um, combined dispatch is important because in today's day and age, there are so many cell phones, um, and I don't know what the percent is right now of the number of 911 calls that are placed by cell phone, but it's, it's a large amount. In the current system that we have in place in Sheboygan and Sheboygan County is those 911 cellular calls go to the county first. When they determine the addresses within the city, they need to be transferred to the city dispatch center. So I believe that that would be a time savings if that was located in one spot. Thank you. <clears throat> also, uh, on the first page after the, uh, of your report, the first page after the logo, I think it's the fifth paragraph, you state here, the current system of fire protection that we have set up in the city of Sheboygan differs from nearly every other city we would consider a comparable. That is a system of five fire stations staffed with two-person uh, fire apparatus and two-person med unit. The national standard is for one fewer fire stations with greater staffing per station. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? 
uh, to my knowledge, um, Manitowoc is the only other city in the state that ever sends a piece of fire apparatus out of a station with only two firefighters on that piece of, on that fire truck. Um, the reason that we do that so often in the city of Sheboygan, and it's probably 70% of the time that we only have two people on a fire truck, is because that we have set up the five fire station system within this city and taken the same amount of firefighters that every other city has and spread them out thinner throughout the city. It's a reason that our response times are so good and I think it's a reason that our outcomes are also so good. Um, other cities operate with maybe one less fewer, one fewer fire station but are sending their fire trucks out with three and four people on instead of two. Uh, my next question is, uh, if because of budget constraints, we would have to go to a system where we would have four stations and 72.5 full-time equivalent, uh, would we still, I think you referenced it in here somewhere, just, but just so I understand it, would we still be within the, the national fire protection standards if we had to go to that? We would be within the NFPA standards for uh, putting 15 firefighters on scene within eight minutes. Um, where we would fall out of the standard is, um, the standard says when you are setting up a, an aerial ladder at a fire, you need to have 17 firefighters on scene. Uh, we would not meet that standard. However, in my opinion, um, the number of times that we set up an aerial ladder in the city for an actual fire, um, either it's well into the incident or um, we call for help from the town of Sheboygan or we call in people. So. Uh, to me, that's not as critical as meeting that 15-person standard, and that we would do under the four-station scenario with 72.5. Thank you. Another question I have, Chief, is that when we have personnel from the fire department retiring with all that valuable experience that they're retiring with, have you given any thought to using retired uh, personnel from your department to do the public education fire inspections or would you even be qualified for training or would current contract language prohibit you from doing that? Uh, at, at present time, we're covering out all of our duties with, with the amount of employees, employees that we have. Um, as I stated in what I, I presented here, if we got down to um, the 54 uh, employee three station scenario or lower, um, we have to come up with some different method of providing those services. When you look at um, departments that are smaller in size, the smaller the department, the larger the Fire Prevention Bureau tends to be. Um, if there's one area that we're lagging behind its members in that bureau, however, I assign those duties to everybody. Um, I think if we got down to a three station scenario, I think anything's on the table. Um, however, I sense that once um, our employees retire, I'd don't get a sense that they want to come back and do what they just did for 30 years or, or, or longer. Well, I guess, my, I guess my question is, you know, you've got all of that valuable experience in those retirees and, you know, bringing them back as possibly a Schedule X employee where they would get a wage and, you know, they wouldn't get any benefits. Would there be any way that you would, even in the current system, that you wouldn't be as spread as thin, you could do a better job in the public education or have them do the inspections or would they be qualified to do training? Uh, in our current system, that would be an added expense for us, so I guess I, I wouldn't be in favor of that. Um, once again, as we got, if we got into one of those other scenarios, we'd have to look at something. I have one more. Uh, back when, uh, back before uh, Chief Lestusky retired, uh, at, the end of, at the end of the year, uh, just before he left, and he was looking at the budget for whatever year that was, I don't know if it was 2009, I can't remember. He invited the older persons up to the uh, headquarters station to go over with us what he was proposing, and he was proposing possibly closing the downtown station. And uh, I know Alderman Heideman and I attended, and I, and I think I remember correctly what he told us, that if he would close the down, if, if he was going to close the station at all, he would consider closing the downtown station. And then he showed us a map of your coverage area, and he said if that, if that would come to pass and the council decided to close that station, that stations number two, three, and four, uh, because of the, it being able to cover the downtown area fairly efficiently, that would be the station 
that he would recommend closing. Now in your, in your plan here of four stations going down to 72.5, you're indicating a possibility of a new station on 14th and Niagara. Uh, can you just go over what Chief Lestusky's ideas were and then why two, three, and four couldn't cover the downtown, why we would need a new station? Um, again, I would agree with Chief Lestusky, and I think I've said that up here before, that if we are going to close a station, um, station one would be my choice. Um, even though that the majority of our fires tend to be in this downtown, older section of town, uh, we do converge on this area very well from three of our other stations. Um, I also put in my proposal that um, while building a new station centrally would take away the inequities of our response times to the downtown area, it is not uh, paramount that you do it um, as a cost saving uh, measure. You would not have to do it, but um, as I said before, with the five station system that we currently have, if you close one of those stations, it's going to create a hole. Um, this map that we have here, I, and we couldn't project it very well, um, has the circles around the five stations that we currently have. And these are three and a half to four minute response times around um, all these stations. So as you can see, we have very equal coverage. We just meet at the outer circles of these stations. Um, so if we would close the downtown station, it is going to create a hole in our coverage, um, basically from 9th Street to the east and from Geely Avenue to roughly Broadway Avenue. And one of the other um, difficulties that we would face, as I said, is uh, the majority of our fires are in this central area where the homes are closer together, homes are older. Um, at those fires, we tend to get two stations there nearly at the same time, which really helps with advancing hose lines and getting those fires controlled. Um, if we do close that uh, downtown station, we will be showing up at those fires um, with only one fire station and we'll be waiting for about two to three minutes for that second station to arrive. So that's one of the reasons that I put in there that um, if you're looking strictly at how do we protect the public the best and you are going to close the station, you need to consider relocating the other station to cover that hole. Thank you. Alderman Van Akron. Thank you, Chairman. Um, again, I think we've seen a lot of data. I think we've heard the Chief's recommendations. We've seen a lot of the data as to the quality of service that's provided currently. Um, at, based on the, the three proposals here in this resolution, um, I, I think it it's apparent that our quality of service would certainly go down. Our response times are certainly going to go up, and I think the, the risk to the public is certainly going to go up. Um, I, I don't think it would be wise for us as a, as a committee or as a council to go forward with any one of these. Um, recommendations or proposals. With that being the case, I guess I would make a motion to file this document or recommend filing this document. Uh, I guess that dies for a lack of a second. Uh, I, don't, uh, I don't believe we should probably be making any decisions on this document tonight as far as you know what scenario we're going to go with because I think it's premature, but that's up to the council. Uh, I would possibly recommend uh, a referral uh, Alderperson Kittleson, do you see any need to, for this to come to your committee or have we discussed it enough tonight? I was thinking possibly of having this go to the Strategic Fiscal Planning Committee for when we get into our budget negotiations, uh, when we know all of those factors and have Strategic Fiscal Planning use this as part of our planning for next, mm -hmm. you know, for next year's budget. Yes. Uh, Alderman Hammond, would you want to see this at finance or would Strategic be the proper place for this to go? You can bring it to strategic fiscal planning. Okay. Finance doesn't need to see I it. Would entertain I, would a agree. I would entertain a motion to that effect. I moved. Second. We have a motion and a second to refer this document to strategic fiscal planning. Uh, Madam City Clerk, would you call the roll? All, all, in. Sure. all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? No. Sure, votes aye. I'm sorry, was there an aye? A no? A no? One no? Yep. Thanks again, Chief. Uh, we're going to take about a seven minute recess before we get into the next agenda items. We all get up and stretch a little bit. Let's convene at 8.30.
Back in session again, please. Uh, let the record show that Alderperson Vanderwilly is excused for the rest of the meeting because of a family issue. So the next thing on the agenda, we have number eight, which is a preliminary consideration of complaints for rem removal filed to date with the city clerk. And I'm gonna call on our city attorney, Steve McLean, to give us a report on that, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first, I would say that uh, I received. I can't hear you. Steve. Yeah. We can't hear you. Usually I get feedback if I talk too close into it. Speak <laughs> louder. Um, the city clerk provided me with copies of five different communications that have been filed in her office and asked the that it provide her an opinion as to whether or not any of those submittals constituted written verified charges brought by a resident taxpayer for purposes of triggering the removal statutes. Uh, <clears throat> so I, I did that and uh, to be fair, the, uh, some of the, the process in this, uh, <clears throat> these circumstances gets a little out of whack. Typically communications come into the city clerk and are introduced at a city council meeting and get referred to committees. Uh, here, uh, these documents have not yet been introduced into the, uh, into the council, uh, so the council hasn't formally received any of them, although I know, because I looked at them, I know they're on the Sheboygan Press website and maybe many other websites as well, I don't know. Uh, but they're out there in the public. Uh, the chairman asked that I make copies for the aldermen of the five uh, complaints because I don't know if the aldermen have looked at them. Uh, I did cut down uh, half a tree to do that if, uh, and I've got, I've made copies, so uh, I might as well pass those out. Preliminary matter, I received an email from uh, one of the, uh, I can't remember which TV channel it was, I think uh, one in Green Bay, asking what my function was in this process and whether or not it was uh, statutorily required that the city attorney review these things as they came in before they went to the council. The answer to that is no. Uh, I was asked to take a look at them, um, and I, I did do that with the uh, view that I would perhaps assist the council in uh, kind of uh, gleaning the wheat from the chaff, so to speak. Um, I think the, uh, the statute is not the clearest, and it hasn't been interpreted very often because these uh, these sorts of situations don't arise uh, on a regular basis um, so I have to say that out at the outset I have provided an opinion and I finished it late this afternoon and uh, the chairman could pass that over to the city clerk that's that's the original uh, I have made copies for the alderman of uh, that opinion as well and I provide that. Uh, to the extent that there aren't enough, uh, the news media can either get it from the city clerk or get it from our office tomorrow. The chairman asked that, and I had agreed at the time we uh, added these items to the agenda to provide my uh, sort of preliminary review of, uh, of the complaints. I did have a fair amount of time today to review them and uh, uh, I'll provide my opinion as to uh, each of them in the order that they were filed. But uh, also as another preliminary matter, uh, I did not and my office in no way is rendering any opinion as to the sufficiency or factual basis 
or merit of any of the charges set forth in the complaints. That determination, in my view, is within the province of the City Council. Uh, I looked at whether or not, in my opinion, uh, these communications uh, met sort of a threshold standard as to whether uh, the written verified charges brought by a resident taxpayer of the governmental unit of which the person against whom the charges are filed is an officer, i.e. a resident taxpayer of the city of Sheboygan. <clears throat> the first complaint was filed on uh, August 1st by Jackie DuPont. <clears throat> and I'll try to go through these briefly and not read them word for word. Uh, Mr. Ms. DuPont signed what I would view a as a communication or a letter. Uh, it's, no, it's not notarized. It's not, there's no declaration in there that uh, the statements contained therein are true. Uh, there's no oath or affirmation to that effect. And in my opinion, such a declaration is required as a minimum to elevate written charges to verified written charges, which is what's called for in the statute. Uh, the removal statute does not define what verified written charges are. Uh, it's pretty obvious what written is. Uh, it's not totally clear anywhere what charges are or what verified are, verified is. There is a uh, definition, however, in the statutes under uh, it's the Uniform Notarial Acts uh, statute uh, that deals with the, what notaries do and so forth that defines verification upon oath or affirmation to mean a declaration that a statement is true made by a person upon oath or affirmation. Uh, so in my view, uh, verification has to do with uh, making it some sort of a declaration that the statements therein are true uh, either upon information of belief or to the best of the person's uh, knowledge and that there's some uh, uh, oath or affirmation to that effect uh, in the document. Uh, there is an attorney general's opinion that talks about verified written charges uh, under the removal statute uh, that that requirement being in place to protect public officials from having to defend themselves in removal actions unless there's a solid factual basis for the complaint. Uh, in other words, uh, uh, all of you as uh, aldermen are elected officials as well. Uh, if all that was required was basically a, a letter into the city council, uh, you could get inundated with uh, complaints on a regular basis uh, against you or uh, myself, the city clerk, uh, any department head, any city employee, uh, and you'd have to deal with them. Uh, so I think the statute is trying to make it uh, not impossible for citizens to bring charges, but to make it to elevate the status of someone doing this, to recognize that uh, this is not a routine sort of thing and uh, that there are consequences and, and uh, repercussions to doing it. Uh, <clears throat> I reference an older Wisconsin Supreme Court case from 1950. Uh, it's not, the case isn't directly on point, but as a tangential issue, the uh, the court noted that where a statute required a verified complaint to be filed with the district attorney prior to the DA commencing an action, uh, that Supreme Court held that the DA was without authority to commence the action without the statutorily required verified complaint. So in my opinion, what that's saying is that if the statute in the removal section says it needs to be written verified charges, that the verified has significance and that without the written verified charges by a resident taxpayer of the city, um, that the council or whoever the removal authority is really is without statutory authority to, to act on that. The reason I say that is because uh, 
the removal statute does say removal removals from office for cause under this chapter may be made only upon written verified charges brought by resident taxpayer of the governmental unit. Uh, so anything less than that, in my view, does not constitute written verified charges. Now, so uh, as to Ms. DuPont's communication, in my view, it's not verified. And in addition, I checked with the city assessor's office. Uh, first, I checked on the city's AS400 uh, computer, which I have access to and uh, found that the address that Ms. DuPont gave us her residence uh, is not, was not owned by Ms. DuPont. So I <coughs> checked with the assessor's office to determine whether Ms. DuPont owned any real estate in the city of Sheboygan or owned any property within the city that's subject <coughs> to taxation. And uh, the response I got back was no, she does not. Assuming that to be the case, uh, I don't feel that uh, it meets the test of coming from a resident taxpayer of the city and therefore would not qualify uh, and council would be without authority to commence removal proceedings based on that complaint. Any questions on that? Any questions from the council? So uh, I guess the only question I would have is then to in between and that would preclude a renter a renter in the city of, city of Sheboygan, according to the statute, then from filing a complaint? Not necessarily. I mean, it could be a renter, but own other real estate in the city and uh, pay taxes. So in other words, just strictly, uh, strictly if she rents that house and does not pay property taxes, then that precludes her from having this, uh, filing this complaint. Well, she can I file can the file complaint. It, but, but having it. Uh, but in my opinion, it would not uh, subject that, uh, that communication to the standard where the council could then go forward with uh, removal proceedings based upon that complaint. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, thanks, Attorney McLean. Yeah, those two issues uh, are really what I focus on uh, in most of these uh, communications. The next uh, was of Deborah Jelinek. Sorry if I mispronounced the name there. Uh, that was uh, dated August 2nd and filed with the city clerk on August 5th. Uh, Ms. Jelenk is a city resident and taxpayer, and that I checked uh, on the AS400 again. And also with the, confirmed that with the assessor's office. Ms. Jelenk's letter is signed and notarized, and in the document, she swears that the statements contained in her letter are the truth to the best of her knowledge. Uh, then I talk about as to whether the letter contains charges. Uh, I guess in my opinion, the short answer is that it, it does. I think that's a, uh, it, it's not a very high bar to, uh, to overcome, in my view, for something to be a charge. I think uh, there's statements that the mayor lied to the council. Um, there's various statements in there that I think can be construed to cons constitute charges. And uh, in my opinion, that communication would pass the initial threshold requirement of written verified charges by a resident taxpayer of the city. Uh, the third complaint I looked at was of Mar Marlene Rindle. Uh, that was dated August 3rd and filed with the city clerk on just the other day on August 8th. Uh, once again, Ms. Rindle is a city resident, but based on information I received from the city assessor's office, uh, she is not a city taxpayer and, and rents an apartment. And again, while her communication sets forth charges and is signed, there's no declaration made upon oath or affirmation that the statements contained therein are true. And basically, I conclude that uh, it doesn't constitute uh, the threshold uh, requirements for the council proceeding to commence removal uh, action based upon that complaint. Uh, the next one I looked at was the complaint of Patrick Gillette, dated and filed August 8th, and I you know, see Pat back there. Uh, in my view, well, I know Pat is a city resident, and, uh, and I did check the S-400 in the assessor's office, he is a city taxpayer, 
His citizen complaint is what it's titled, is signed, notarized, and sworn to on information and belief, and that the various allegations and statements contained therein could constitute charges for purposes of the removal statute, and in my opinion, it would meet the threshold standards for the council to uh, uh, be within its authority to commence removal proceedings based on that complaint. Uh, the final one I looked at was the uh, complaint of Asher Heimerman, dated and filed August 8th. Uh, again, Mr. Heimerman is a city resident. Uh, he didn't make any allegation about being a city taxpayer and based upon information that I received from the city assessor's office, it is not owned property which is being taxed by the city. Uh, <clears throat> he notarizes, his document is notarized. Uh, the notarization, the way I read it, is, is basically your typical notarization and, and what that represents is the notary uh, makes a verification that the signature is that of the person that claims to be Mr. Asher Heimerman. Uh, it's not, just because it's notarized in my view does not make it a any sort of declaration made on oath or affirmation that the charges contained therein are true and there are no statements to that effect in the communication. Uh, so in short, I conclude that on those two bases that the council would be without authority to commence removal proceedings based on that complaint. Uh, <clears throat> so on the last page, I, I conclude in summary, uh, three of the complaints I don't think meet the threshold requirements. Uh, two, I believe, do, Ms. Joinks and Mr. Gillette's. Uh, and I think the council could consider those as far as uh, proceeding further with removal proceedings. <clears throat> and I, I close with a statement that the, uh, while it may be within the council's authority to initiate removal proceedings upon submission of written verified charges by a resident taxpayer, the council is not obligated to do so. Such actions are discretionary on the council's part. Uh, if you do proceed, and, and we'll talk a little bit further about the process uh, beyond that, but uh, I would suggest as a threshold by the council that there be uh, some majority vote or something to uh, go forward with uh, whatever it is you want to do. Uh, the statutes do provide, this is uh, the removal statute, I should go back, is chapter uh, or section 17.16 of the Wisconsin statutes and it's subsection three that has most of the requirements. But in subsection four, it does say that the council uh, may, before acting upon any charges preferred against any officer, require the person preferring the charges to execute and deliver to the authority, or in this case the council, a bond in the sum of $1,000 uh, uh, for the payment of all costs and expenses actually incurred by the city uh, uh, and by the removing power in the hearing and investigation of the charges. Uh, once again, that's discretionary in my view and uh, it's not required that the council require that. Um, I don't know if there's any questions as any to question? that aspect. And then, uh, Attorney McQueen, if there's no questions, let's move on to item number nine, the procedure in the event of formal removal process. Uh, first, let me go back and uh, once again, there are two methods that the statutes provide for uh, non-voluntary termination of an elected official's office, at least a, a local elected official. Uh, th those are removal and recall. Uh, statewide, a lot of people, not necessarily in our area because we didn't have a recall election today, but. Uh, many parts of the state they did over uh, 
state senators. Um, that recall process is it's a very effective process. It's one initiated by citizens. If they don't like their elected official uh, who was elected by the same people, they uh, submit a, circulate a petition, get enough signatures, uh, have a referendum election, and vote that person out of office if they so choose. That's sort of grassroots democracy where the individual citizens have, uh, have and pursue uh, that process. Uh, one uh, threshold requirement is uh, the office holder has to have been in office for at least a year. Uh, that's not an issue in Sheboygan because the mayor's been in office for uh, over two years now, I believe it is. <clears throat> uh, the other process is removal that uh, basically puts the uh, power of uh, removing an elected official in the hands of the city council. When it comes Steve, to excuse me, just a moment. Uh, if we could just follow up on that, on that, uh, uh, the one you were just talking about. Recall. Uh, pardon? Recall. Recall. Uh, Sue, I don't want to catch you off guard, but I know you and I talked about this a couple days ago. Uh, could you, would you be prepared just to go through the process of uh, approximately how many signatures, I think it was 4,000 something, and then what the process is for the time period that the filers have to get the signatures and what happens, and then when you project if it was a recall election, when it would take place? Love to. <laughs> um, okay, with a recall election, um, I've done the numbers. It basically is, um, if there's the sig let's talk about the signatures first. What I do is I take 25% of the votes cast for the last gubernatorial race. In our case, I don't know, don't quote me on the exact number, but I believe it's 4,100 and something. So let's just say 4,200, just to be safe. Um, so to recall the mayor, it would be a citywide recall election. Um, it obviously would take more than the 41, 4,200 signatures because you don't hand in just the exact amount you need. You would have to have over that in order to, when they come back into me, we have to verify, you know, addresses, et cetera. So we, with any candidate, always say there have to be more than what is absolutely needed. To start the process, what would happen is a person would come into our office, the city clerk's office, and they need to file um, a notice of intent to, to circulate a petition for recall. That's the first step. <coughs> they also have to take out the, ca the typical campaign papers, the registration forms. For a campaign, it would be perhaps um, a committee, a recall committee called you know, recalling the mayor or recalling John Smith or whoever it is. They would take out those papers. The minute they file the intent, um, and take out those papers, the clock starts running. From that point, for 60 days, they would have to collect the signatures, up to 60 days. When they turn the signatures in, say it's 60 days, um, then I have 31 days after that to verify all, the, all of the, the face of each of the petitions. Um, within that 31 days, I also have to allow the official that's being recalled um, a 10-day period where they can challenge before I finish my 31 days. Then we move into um, the setting up, you know, if it is verified and everything, then the council would order a recall election. Then it would be a waiting period as far as um, when the election would actually happen. Uh, in estimating it, if it were to be a 60-day, 31-day, <coughs> My guess is that the earliest the election could be would probably be sometime in December or possibly January. Um, the mayor would automatically be on the ballot. He would not have to take out campaign papers. And then anyone else that qualifies to be the <coughs> official would take out campaign papers to run against the mayor, the current mayor. And that's how it would generally go. I can't give you any more details right off the top of my head, but that's generally how it would go. 
Are there any questions from the alderman on the process? Alderman Riesler. What if there were like three uh, other candidates? Would we have to have a primary? Yes. And that would take more time? Yes. More money. Uh, Alderperson Kittleson. Thank you, Chairman. In the cost, uh, Sue, approximately. Um, this would, you know, because we'd have to open citywide, it would be opening all of our polling locations. Um, typically, I estimate anywhere from 15000 to 25000 depending on how many people I have to hire, et cetera. Somewhere in that range, I can't give you an exact. Thank you. Thank you, Alderperson Kittleson. Are there any other questions? Thank you, Sue. You're welcome. Steve, if you want to continue. Okay. Uh, the second uh, option, obviously, is uh, removal under the state statutes for uh, city officials is 17.16. Um, under, under that process, uh, the, uh, these charges that are filed need to be prosecuted. Basically, it's, it becomes uh, similar to what we do with law and licensing. There's a quasi-judicial hearing held. Uh, quasi-judicial in that it's not in a court, it's in a legislative arena. Uh, but it's sort of a, an analogous process to a certain extent. Uh, as I see it, at least uh, theoretically, there's a couple ways that that could work. Uh, and, and again, let me preface, uh, I'm talking of what's in the statute and and theorizing somewhat because uh, I'm not aware of anywhere in the state where there's been a removal process of a mayor in the state of Wisconsin now maybe going back a number of years there there have been I am aware of one reported case from the 70s that involved a city clerk or so, but the, that was <laughs> uh, where there was a removal proceeding. Uh, escapes me what community it was, uh, but uh, that went uh, after the council went through their process and removed that officer. Um, there's provision for appeals to the circuit court and up the chain to the Court of Appeals, and this particular DeLuca case went to the State Supreme Court. Uh, now, that's because at the time, there was not a Court of Appeals, an intermediate court in Wisconsin, but so it went from the trial court to uh, the appellate court, which was the State Supreme Court, but that potentially is, is a lengthy process. Uh, and and not an inexpensive process. Now, I, I just say that not to say that you can't do that, because you can, but uh, it's not something to be taken lightly, I guess uh, is the point of that. Uh, going back, I think the, in theory, uh, you could have the complainant who, who is, you could treat basically as the plaintiff in a lawsuit Say, okay, uh, Mr. Complainant, you filed these charges. You're charging that uh, the mayor did this, that, and the other thing, and that he should be removed. Uh, we're going to put the burden on you to prosecute the case. You prove it, and we'll act, uh, the council will act as judge and jury and render an opinion as to whether you proved up your case. Uh, I don't think that that is the process that's intended by the statutes, but it's not, it doesn't really talk to that. Uh, the fact that it talks about having the complainant perhaps post a bond would lead me to believe that the process is different than that, that it's not the complainant necessarily that prosecutes the charges. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, the other option, as I see it, would be to hire a special prosecutor have the council hire a special prosecutor if they chose to go forward to prosecute the charges, and it would have to be those charges that are submitted that are 
that meet the test of the verified written charges. In this case, in my opinion, again, it's just my opinion, I think there are two. Uh, the statute doesn't really get into whether or not you can either pick or choose one or the other or sort of do a hybrid. I would assume you could, uh, the council could decide to go forward with both kind of at the same time and uh, prove up the case uh, using both of them. Again, the, the standard that the council has to arrive at for removal is statutory and it's cause for the purpose of the removal statute is defined as inefficiency, neglect of duty, official misconduct, or malfeasance in office. Uh, now those aren't further defined in the statute and it's kind of left up to the, uh, the deciding body as to what, uh, what meets that standard. That, that's a, a sort of a disc discretionary test, I think. Uh, but I think there clearly has to be some cause for removal. And the statute makes clear it has to be by a three-quarter vote of the full membership of the council. So in this case, uh, it would be 12, I guess, uh, three-quarters of 16 as a minimum to, uh, to remove. Um, I say special prosecutor because, in my opinion, our office is pretty much, if this goes forward, is going to be out of the picture. I think uh, our office has a conflict. Uh, we, uh, our authority and duty is to provide advice and counsel to the mayor and the council, which constitutes the governing body of the city. Uh, and uh, we're not gonna prosecute one of our clients, if you will. Um, I don't think that's what meet any standards of due process and uh, would probably <coughs> violate the, our office's uh, code of, you know, uh, code of conduct uh, for, for attorneys. So uh, that means hiring outside counsel uh, to act as special prosecutor. Uh, likewise, in my view, it would be uh, prudent for the council, and perhaps I'm overstating, overstepping uh, my bounds here because, as I say, I think uh, go forward, uh, our office is going to drop out of this uh, issue. But uh, I guess I think it would be prudent for the council to consider hiring uh, special counsel also to represent the council in in the. Uh, sort of the hearing process and the procedure that needs to be followed. <clears throat> so that's two outside counsel. And uh, there's certainly a cost to that and I can't give you really uh, any sort of uh, reasonable ballpark figure as to what the costs of that uh, would be. There would be so many variables. I, I, wouldn't even want to hazard a guess. I, I can tell you that, at least from reading the Manitowoc, or the Marinette Eagle Herald, I think it is, the, their newspaper online, uh, from what was in their paper, they were ballparking a similar process with their mayor at uh, between ten and $50,000 uh, for basically outside council services. I think you You'd also want to uh, contract with a court reporter. Uh, the statute talks about hiring a stenographer, but I think if you're gonna go through the process, you wanna have a good record, and you should have a court reporter recording all of the proceedings. Uh, Steve, could I just ask a quick question on that? That would preclude, that would be, would preclude your staff from, from taking minutes like they do at a at our quasi-judicial hearings, uh, when you said your, your department is out of it, does that include your clerical staff? No, I, I don't think as far as taking minutes or anything like that. But Could they act as a, uh, the court reporter? Well, they're, they're, not, they're, they're not, not court they're reporters. Not, they're not certified. They're not court reporters. Right. Uh, 
Could they act as stenographers? Yes, and the, the statute talks about stenographers, but I guess uh, what I'm suggesting is that you might want to go beyond that and use a court reporter. But again, uh, I guess uh, my thought is that what you may want to do if you're going to go that go down that route is uh, get on board an attorney that will be representing the council and perhaps discuss with that individual. Uh, Generally, didn't do depositions. I don't believe the, the city attorney, uh, assistant city attorney, Chuck Adams, did any any depositions, or I don't even believe the defense counsels did. They, we basically subpoenaed the people, and then they just. Uh, the, the councils, each council, the, the prosecutor and the and the defendant's counsel were at, at, able to ask questions. Uh, is that a is that a hard fast rule or are depositions a possibility in this kind of a procedure? Um, well, again, I there's not a whole lot of uh, precedent. I don't I don't think, but uh, I would think depositions would uh, would not be wise to permit. I don't think that the, that necessarily uh, depositions would would be required to provide due process to both to all the parties. Uh, the statutes don't talk about depositions. It talks about a speedy speedy hearing um, and the ability of the the accused and, and their counsel to confront the witnesses and uh, cross-examine witnesses. I think that's clear. But, uh, uh, you know, I hate to harken back to the Angela Payne situation, but uh, that was filed a couple of years ago and was, you know, had been set for hearing next week, you know. Part of that is, was a lot of procedural processes, depositions and uh, interrogatories and all that. Uh, uh, you know, if you want to eat up a lot of time and money, you do that, but I don't think that that's uh, required under due process standards for a removal proceeding. Thank you. Any other questions from the alderman? <coughs> uh, thank you, Steve. Go Just ahead. another caveat. I guess uh, if and when the council uh, decides to hire council representing them, perhaps that's a question you would ask them as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Steve. Uh, the next item on the agenda is number 10, funding and hiring of special counsel. I see our financial uh, director, uh, Jim Amodio, is in the audience, and I'd like to call Jim up uh, to answer some questions we may have regarding funding this if we would in, indeed decide to head with this removal process. So, Director Amodio, could you step up to the podium, please? Uh, Director Amodio, uh, from what Attorney McLean said, we can't give you a, a, a hard, fast figure, but based on, based on what he did mention about a, a figure of from $10,000 up to $50,000, when we're talking that kind of money, where would you envision those funds coming from if we decided to go ahead with this? Well, uh, as you know, uh, coming into the 2011 budget, we did have a contingency fund uh, that we used uh, to meet our budget in 2011. So our current budget does, does not have a contingency fund in it. Uh, my recommendation would be that if you chose to use funds, you have the authority to uh, uh, use some of the uh, undesignated reserve funds in the general fund balance. In the general fund. Uh, any questions from the alderman? Uh, alderman Matichek. And right now, if we wouldn't uh, spend that money, what would that money go towards for next year? Spend from the, the, the general fund? Money? Well, the general fund has a reserve balance in it. Uh, we're required by uh, local ordinance to maintain uh, a certain percentage of that in reserve in case there's emergencies within the city. Uh, but those funds can be used that are undesignated. Uh, and, and currently, what's the, what's the balance? Uh, the balance is $5.4 million. Any other questions? Uh, Attorney McLean? 
uh, Jim, my understanding that would require though a budget alteration. To, that is correct. To move the funds from the undesignated reserves to some account to cover that. Correct. Which would, would have to be a resolution. A, 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 a two-thirds vote of the council to do. Yes. Any other questions for Director Modio? Thanks, Jim. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Alderman Hammond. Uh, Jim, what is the level that uh, the undesignated funds uh, is mandated by? Well, it's, it's normally 18% of our next year's budget. Uh, so if we spend $35 million, it would be close to six, six and a half million dollars. Uh, we just barely meet the threshold. Uh, <clears throat> from 10 to 11, we improved it from 3.6 to 5.4. Uh, we still have a ways to go to meet our 18 percent. So but in emergencies, we can use those funds. It does, at some point, uh, you know, if we're go out, going out for large bond issues, uh, could affect our bond rating because they do look heavily at our undesignated reserves. So at, at this point in time, we're not at the threshold? Correct. Any other questions? I think that's it. Thank you, Director Amolio. <laughs> the next thing I, would, I would, want to, would want to discuss with the Council is what action, if any, does the Council want to take? Uh, because we do have two verifiable complaints here. What action, if any, do we want to take uh, to remove the mayor from office, and I'll open that up for discussion. President Rinfleisch. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I was expecting a bit more conversation at this point in time from uh, fellow older persons. Uh, the vote was 14 to 2 last time, asked for his resignation. Um, I believe, though, that wasn't based upon um, politics, budgets. It was based upon a, a, uh, a feeling of res responding to their constituents. Uh, I think in most cases, uh, those that voted two against and those that voted 14 for that motion were responding to the constituents. Uh, I don't hear anything in this conversation right now that would lead me to believe that the constituents would change their mind. Any actions that we take today obviously we would have to get voted upon by the Common Council. It does give us a few days of, if we make some motions today uh, to hear back from our constituents um, to you know, either alter our course or, or, or look at some other options that way. Um, but um, the uh, phone calls uh, that I've received um, basically involve do whatever it takes at this point in time. Um, so my, I may, my goal is to maintain that. And I will continue to do that. You're saying uh, uh, anything that it takes for removal? Right. Uh, I'll make a motion at this time if, if no one else has any ideas, any thoughts. Um, motions would be to um, uh, proceed, oh, I guess motion would be to recommend to the Common Council to proceed with the formal removal process. Furthermore, uh, the motion would be to um, direct, I guess, uh, the whole president, common council president, common council vice president to interview potential attorneys. Um, and the third resolution would be to uh, a budget resolution um, uh, to um, use undesignated funds um, to fund the hiring of the attorneys. Second. I'll second that. We have a motion and a second. Uh, I wasn't, I don't want to take, can't take shorthand, so. Uh, I don't either, okay. so you may want to read it again. <laughs> well, there's nothing written down, so I'll have to go again. Uh, the resolution, um, your feedback. Resolution would be to uh, direct, um, I guess, to recommend to the Common Council to commence the formal removal process. Um, furthermore, uh, to direct, I guess, council leadership 
uh, to interview and hire um, the two attorneys, one for counsel for the counsel and one for special prosecutor. And furthermore, because it's a budget item, um, to move uh, the undesignated to, to I guess, uh, create, a resolution. create a resolution to move um, from undesignated funds, the funds necessary to hire the attorneys. Undesignated funds to? Uh, move from undesignated funds, uh, the funds necessary to hire the attorneys. We have a motion and a second, and now we're under discussion. Alderman Hammond. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I guess I would just offer maybe a friendly resolution um, based off of what uh, Attorney McLean had indicated. Um, maybe the first step would be to hire just the council representative, the attorney representing the council, get his or her feedback as to what Attorney McLean presented in the process, and then determine from there whether a special prosecutor is necessary. So I guess I would just offer that as a friendly amendment. Uh, President Rinpleish. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Not opposed uh, to that amendment. Um, trying to, though, in, in essence of time, of, of a speedy hearing, uh, as Attorney McLean had pointed out. Um, I guess um, that would be the intent, you know. But uh, the, at least the resolution would be there that if we need to proceed, then uh, it's been allocated at that point in time. But uh, uh, Attorney McLean's uh, point on speaking with our own um, counsel about the validity of the specific charges now, I think it's important to do first. So I agree, but that would, that would be within that picture. Uh, also, uh, uh, President Rinfleisch had asked a question before I would make a motion, a friendly, a friendly amendment. Uh, do you think it would be a good idea to possibly put a cap on the transfer and then as we go, if, if we go along in this process, maybe, the, uh, you know, just hypothetically, if the cap was $50,000, that we get a report back from our council when we maybe reach $40,000. Because I know some lawsuits in the past with the city, we've ended up with a big legal bill surprise. And uh, I'm just offering that as thought of possibly incorporating that into your motion to have a cap in there that whatever the cap is, and then perhaps when we get three quarters there get advice from our legal counsel as to where you know the clock is running and how much we spent and how much we have to go and then we also can evaluate where we are in the process at that time again not opposed to that as well it's the motion is meant to be a motion from the body uh, so the will of the body um, so I would accept that motion uh, I'd, I'd make a friendly amendment to put a cap on the expense at fifty thousand uh, dollars with a with a report from our counsel when we've reached the $40,000 mark. Make that friendly amendment. Second. And then, of course, the document that comes through for the meeting on Monday night would reflect the, the transfer would be a transfer of up to $50,000. Uh, Sue, what's the procedure? Do we have to vote on my friendly amendment? It's been seconded or? Um. Well, it's a friendly amendment. I think that we incorporate that in the one before, but my question would be, you said that you wanted to have the leadership interview and hire two attorneys. You've got that, plus then you've got, let's do the another friendly amendment that says let's just hire one. So which one do you want to? One says two, one says one. Uh, Alderman Hammond? I don't think my button's working, sorry. Um, you know, maybe again, just as a suggestion, we can certainly authorize the leadership to hire up to two, up, um, two. up to two, and that might solve that. But again, um, I think at least initially would hire one. I would just also like to make a comment about the cap, um, keeping in mind that it takes two thirds of this body to, if we cap it at 50,000, it takes two thirds of this body to raise it a second time to authorize more money. So instead of putting a cap on it, um, again, a little bit of a friendly amendment would be maybe to um, appropriate whatever's needed, um, but then the council can dish it out after review at forty thousand dollars. Put that in writing. I, I would go along. I would go along with that. That's your amendment now. So. I would withdraw. I would withdraw mine and go with Alderman Hammond's. It's not put a cap on it, but review it at forty thousand. If it gets that much, if it gets to be that much. 
I'll withdraw my second and second the new motion. <laughs> Thanks, Jerry. Is there any other discussion from the alderman? Uh, alderman Matichek. I, I just want to get this clear that tonight we hear about from the fire department how they may have to close uh, firehouses, risk lives uh, by cutting in time so that they can respond to, uh, to, and we haven't made our threshold for, for next year's budgeting. Um, so that money is going to have to come out somewhere. Basically, we're ensuring making cuts such as closing the firehouses and whatnot to pursue the chance of removal, and then even then, we, we don't even know for a fact that it's going to be a, a for sure removal when we have the option of a uh, recall, which would limit the city's liability and future spending of the removal of the mayor, if, that, if that's truly the, the will of the people. Thank you, Alderman Matichek. Uh Alderman Heideman. Thank you, uh, Chairman. Um, I don't want to get a lot more phone calls on this. I get enough comments during the day, uh, but my phone is not ringing off the hook as far as whether they're for or against uh, uh, getting rid of uh, uh, proceeding to uh, take Bob from office. Um, I guess I would think that um, spending $50,000 on something that might resolve itself in a year and a half uh, might be a waste of our money. Uh, so I'm not going to support spending any money to try to get um, uh, the mayor out of office, though I did uh, and would have liked to see him resign, and I voted in favor of that. I have, I have trouble spending our uh, hard-earned tax dollar on something that might be alleviated, or uh, there might be the other option of uh, the recall. Uh, I guess I'd rather see that come forward and limit our, uh, our liability to that, but, uh, so I can't support a $50,000 cap to, uh, to go, on, go against the mayor. Well, I think the current motion on the floor is that there is there's no there's no cap. Okay. Well, even spending any, I don't want to spend one dime on uh, on doing that. So. Alder Person Kittleson. Thank you, uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, just to to uh, uh, ask though, those undesignated funds are are for emergency. You wouldn't use that money to to fund the fire department anyway. So those are, those, those are monies put away you know, for emergencies, um, just to make that clear. I think that's, uh, that's correct. Am I not, am I, am I right in that? Thank uh, you. I think, uh, Director Ramonio? You'd have to step up here. Uh, the city in the past 10 years, probably six to seven times out of those 10 years, has used undesignated fund reserve balances to fund expense budgets for the city. So we do use that. So in, in your example, if we wanted to fund the fire department an extra two or three hundred thousand dollars and the council approved it, we could do that. Any other discussion? Alderman Matichek. So once again, th that money could go to saving the, the fire uh, house or it could go towards pursuing this If the option. council so chooses, that's correct. Thank you, Alderman Matichek. Any further discussion? Alderman Sampson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I don't believe we're at an issue here where we're deciding on keeping or closing a firehouse in order to pursue this matter. Uh, I think those are two completely different issues. So we're not choosing to close one or keep one open just so we can to this particular situation. Thank you, Alderman Sampson. Uh, Alderman Hammond, I think you're next. Oh, you, that was from before. Thank you. Uh, President Rinfleisch. Thank you. Um, I guess to make it clear, uh, to respond to Alderman um, Heidemann, I don't want to spend a penny either on this. Um, the actions taken weren't taken by me. It was taken by the mayor, and the responses that we took last time in the 14 to 2 vote um, was a response that we took lightly. It was a response to the mayor's actions uh, and it's a response to the comments that I'm receiving on the street 
uh, at home. Um, and I'd rather not spend a penny either. But we, we asked the mayor to resign. He, did not, he publicly stated that he will not do so. Um, by not doing anything, I think we're granting approval for the behaviors. Uh, I think we're granting acceptance uh, that for the next um, year and several months that we're okay with what had happened. Um, and quite frankly, I don't think that's acceptable. I think we have no alternative because the mayor has forced us into the situation. Thank you, President Rinfleisch. Uh, Alderman Heidemann, uh, I think you and I probably uh, qualify as a couple of the uh, biggest penny pinchers when it comes to the taxpayers' money on this council. Uh, I have to tend to agree with uh, Alderman Rinfleisch. Uh, <coughs> based on the calls that I've been getting from District 4, I've been getting the same volume of calls for removal as perhaps you, and I don't want to spend a dime either. But under the circumstances, we asked the mayor to step up, man up, and resign, and he refused to do it. So this, has ba this leaves us basically with no other alternative if we want to move forward with this. But I, I agree with you, Joe. I don't want to spend any money either, but under the circumstances, if we move ahead with this, we don't have any choice. Uh, any, other, any other discussion? Okay. Uh, with no further discussion, I believe we're ready for a roll call on this. Uh, is everybody clear what we're voting on? Sue, can you go through I it? I can kind of general, generally go All through right. it because I've got it on tape. Um, basically, there was a motion to recommend to the Common Council to proceed with uh, the formal removal process, in addition to have the leadership interview and hire up to two attorneys, in addition to draft a resolution for a budget transfer using undesignated funds and to have those undesignated funds with no cap basically and the reporting by the legal counsel that's been hired when it gets to be 40,000 and then advise future. Is that basically what mm -hmm. you all said? Attorney McShane, does this take a simple majority or two thirds? Uh, it's just a recommendation. Just a recommendation. It's just a recommendation of the council, simple majority. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so like to work for it. Madam City Clerk, would you please call the roll? Carlson? Aye. Decker? Aye. Hammond? Aye. Hammond? Aye. Heidemann? Nope. Koth? Aye. Kittleson? Aye. Matichek? No. Rinfleisch? Aye. Raisler? Aye. Sampson? Aye. Van Akron? Aye. Vanderweel? I'm sorry, she's gone. Aye. <laughs> Belt? Aye. And Boren? Chair votes aye. 12 ayes, 2 noes. The next thing on the agenda, uh, it passes. Uh, the next thing on the agenda is a sex set the next meeting date, and that will be uh, determined depending on referral to the uh, committee of the whole. I will entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Second. Motion and second to adjourn. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Thank you, everybody.